Tartarian Empire, which was once all over the world, is now nothing but a lost civilization. Some say it was wiped away by the New World Order in a massive genocide, while others believe it's a fringe conspiracy theory with no backing to it. All the evidence I've examined tells me that Tartaria did exist, and that the powers that be spent a lot of energy, money, and power in getting us to believe it never did. The framework of our fundamental beliefs has been built upon a massive lie. And this orchestration of our false history has in turn created an oppositional force that assumes its core identity is being attacked when presented with the findings in these films. The information to follow is not to attack, it's to unravel. In a very real way, generations have been programmed to see the world inaccurately, and with tools such as MKUltra, there is a sector of our public that will fight to the death for what they believe without ever questioning it. My job is to provide you with information that will assist in the unraveling of what may very well have been the greatest psychological operation known to man, a worldwide psyop on humanity, or as Morpheus puts it, a prison for your mind. In a very real way, the Matrix is what we're living in, and the powers that have created our world are fighting tooth and nail to keep it theirs. Because of the internet, information has spread just as fast as the cancer that has grown to enslave humanity. Information is vital to knowing who we are, where we come from, and where we're headed. You might ask, how do we escape this matrix? With knowledge and information. By discovering the truth, the truth shall set us free. I invite you to explore the hidden truths of our history so that it may unlock the infinite possibilities of our greater tomorrow. This begins now by uncovering what was once and will be again the Great Tartarian Empire. Tartaria, originally pronounced Tartaria without the first R is the name of the pre-Mongolian empire that originated in Northern Asia before spanning the entire Northern Hemisphere. Great Tartaria was the largest empire during its time and would still have been the largest empire today. The sphere on the outside tips over as I stand, and we can therefore run round corners in accordance with our tip. Tartaria a once thriving civilization that exemplified the pinnacle of greatness and potential of humanity is no longer present today, but its vestiges have been left behind as clues and crumbs for future generations to discover and question what happened. Tartaria had some of the most brilliant, fascinating, and powerful spiritual beings. With their extraordinary way of being, they invented and discovered technologies that would make them appear like futuristic travelers that landed in a distant past. Their culture was robust and magnificent, their government equally as so. It consisted of independent nations ruled by qualified princes, elected by local council of wise men, and counseled by women. Their territories had flags, maps, and most notably their architecture, which remnants still exist today, proved that modern technology advancements are nothing in comparison to what they built. Not only because of its beauty, but because of the fact that their buildings were made to capture and distribute free energy all over the world. Could you imagine our world today if it had free energy? Could you imagine free means of travel anywhere at any time? How about free healing in a world where disease was unlikely? It's difficult to imagine because we live in a world where massive corporations are dependent upon charging us to receive what God has already gifted us. Gas, electricity, medicine, food. If you control energy, you control the people, and you control the world. How did it get this way? 
Before we explore more of the brilliance of Tartarian technology, let's visit our recent past to first understand how Tartaria was erased from history and who were the ones doing it. We'll start at the beginning of the end, the 18th century, when the Romanov Empire conquered many Tartarian territories, leading to the creation of the United States. And lastly, their massive effort to hide and erase Tartaria from humanity's conscious collective. The Tartarian Empire, thought to have belonged to just Eastern Russia, actually inhabited most if not all of the world. The Tartars, as they were known, carried their vast empire from Russia, China, to even the Far East, the Americas. North America, to be specific, was an extension of the Siberian American Horde, also known as Moscow Tartary. You see, Tartaria's territories were everywhere and they were labeled as such. Petite Tartary, Eastern Tartary, Russian, Moscow, Chinese, and Mongol Tartary. Moscow Tartary was completely conquered by the Romanovs in the middle of the 19th century. The Romanov name is due to their claimed descent from the Roman Empire as they saw Moscow as the third Rome. The Romanovs were in control of Russia for just a few centuries and ended in the early 20th century the hands of Bolshevik secret police who captured and murdered the Russian Tsar Nicholas II along with his entire family. Taking over Moscow Tartary, which the Romanovs eventually did, made them a world superpower. The conflict between Moscow Tartary and Romanov Russia ended in the second half of the 18th century with the famous peasant war against Pugachev. Pugachev was the leader of a series of successful rebellions against the Russian Empire during the reign of Catherine the Great. At this time, the Romanovs strived to conquer the Siberian American Horde at all cost. They understood very well that the Russian people didn't support them and many would prefer the regime of Tobolsk to the Romanovs. Tobolsk was the center of Russian colonization of Siberia when an ally of the Tsar of Tobolsk, Turkey, signed a peace treaty with the Romanovs, they essentially betrayed Pugachev and the Siberian army. What was once a promising rebellion ended in 1775, when Pugachev's own men captured him and sent him to Moscow to be murdered. That is why the Romanovs turned the very existence of their Siberian neighbor to a national secret. To preserve this secret, the infamous secret police was created where executioners tortured and hung those who knew too much. Pugachev was beheaded on January 21st, 1775. As a result, one year later, the United States of America emerged on May 1st, 1776, where Freemason Adam Washupt established their territorial claims. With the stronghold of the Tartarian Empire conquered, the Romanovs ventured to the Americas as Moscow Tartary was there and left without any governmental authority. The European emigrants who had settled on the Atlantic seaboard of North America then ventured west, and for decades they seized the North American territories of Moscow Tartary. The Romanovs went about voraciously slicing up the vast territories of Moscow Tartary and rewriting history in the process. In America, they began with Alaska, and then Washington and Oregon were ceded to the Romanovs in 1819, while the rest of North America went to the USA. Before this, the influence of Moscow in the Americas was massive. Note how many US cities were named Moscow in the early 1800s. Interesting, isn't it? This Romanov takeover of the inhabitants of the Americas has been beautifully but incorrectly narrated in Hollywood films about the very noble white frontiersmen and the very savage Indians. So did they hide the truth about Native American Indians? 
Well, of course, because they were really Mongolian descendants of Tartaria. Let's unravel some more hidden truths about the origins of America and explore more in depth who the Native Americans actually were. Initially, the territories of Canada, United States, and Mexico were known as India Superior and were populated by a previously advanced American civilization called the Moors. The Moors are who we know as Tartarians. They were responsible for the building of Gothic architecture in America and around the world. Interestingly, they were also known as the Berber Indians, all one and the same people, as they all originate from the Mur people of India Superior that had previously civilized the world. This map is very significant because it demonstrates that the Americas are Asia Major, Asia Proper, also known as the Orient or the East or another word for it, India Superior. So what language did Tartarians speak? Well, the universal language spoken throughout the Tartarian Empire was Arabic and Sanskrit. Therefore, the original Moors were likely Islamic. Islam was prominent in America and had a massive influence on it. There are a total of 565 names, 484 in America and 81 in Canada, of villages, towns, cities, mountains, lakes, and rivers that are etymologically Arabic. These names were designated by locals long before the arrival of Columbus. Many of these names are in fact the same names of Islamic places. Mecca. Medina in Idaho and also in New York, Medina in Hazen in North Dakota, Medina in Ohio, Medina in Tennessee and in Texas, Medina and Arva in Ontario, Mahomet in Illinois, and Mona in Utah are just a few noticeable names at the outset. A closer analysis of the names of native tribes will immediately reveal their Arabic etymological ancestry. Anasazi, Apache, Arawak, Arakana, Shavin, Cherokee, Cree, Ohokam, Upa, Hopi, Maka, Mohican, Mohawk, Nazca, Zulu, and Zuni are only a few. Islam was everywhere in the Americas. One just has to go look for it because you can see the evidence from Queen Khalifa, where California derives its name, Khalifa meaning successor in Arabic, to Alabama, Alabama, Tallahassee, Tallahassee, to Medina, Ohio, to Moorestown, New Jersey, to Islamorada, Florida, and to Alhambra, California. Even my last name, Alviar, contains Arabic roots. So it's very likely Muslims left a huge impact on America. To understand further, let's look into what Moor means. After all, that is what they were called, the Moors. Moor comes from the Orient, the Far East. What's also interesting is that Oriental According to the book, Orientalism by Edward Said is defined as a Western scholar who studies Islam. So Islam comes from the Orient. It was the Romanovs who ordered the native Moors to leave their lands and march without water or food for days, and we know this as the Trail of Tears. The aim was to exterminate them without spending ammunition, while others were killed on their own land through blankets tainted with smallpox. David Edward Stannard, born in 1941, is an American historian and professor of American studies at the University of Hawaii. In 1992, he wrote American Holocaust, Conquest of the New World. He chronicles that the genocide against the native Black Moor population was the largest genocide in history. The extermination of the Black Moors went roaring across two continents nonstop for four centuries consuming the lives of tens of millions of people, while acknowledging that the majority of the indigenous peoples fell victim to the ravages of European disease, 
He estimates that almost 100 million died in what he calls the American Holocaust. This leads us to question, where do African slaves fit into this picture? Did Native American tribes help slaves escape? Or were Americans with African ancestry already part of the Native American nations? We already know that over 83% of all Americans with African ancestry have Native American blood. So, this leads us to presume that Native Americans were black people, the Moors, and contrary to historical data, they were not brought here on ships. That's right, the slaves of American history were not brought here on ships from Africa. That's the lie, they were already here. Instead, they were enslaved right here on their own lands. If they were brought on ships, the numbers are extremely exaggerated. It was published that 15 million to 20 million slaves arrived in the Americas between 1540 and 1850 over a 310 year period, and that's according to US history books. Although the Stuart synopsis points out a few questions that should be examined. Over a period of 300 years, is it fair to say that 60,000 slaves were transported annually to the Americas? Or could it be the transportation of slaves to the Americas was one big myth? The largest seagoing vessel carried 400 slaves, but not all the ships were that large. The time of passage was three to four months. That means 200 vessels or ships per year would have to travel carrying 300 people, and one ship can make three passages per year. The Transatlantic Slave Trade Database says that there were 1,100 to 1,400 voyages made over that 300-year period. If that is the case, and each ship carried 400 people, the total number would be 560,000 Africans transported. See, the numbers do not add up. After 20 years, the Royal Adventurer with its 15 ships had transported between 90,000 to 100,000 slaves. That is a long way from 15 million to 20 million slaves who were supposedly brought to the Americas. Doesn't that leave a little over 14 million to 19 million people not accounted for? What's up with that? Or was the black-brown birth rate more accelerated than the white birth rate? The calculated median of 15 and 20 million would be 17.5 million. Divided by 400 people, the capacity of the largest slave vessel, that comes out to 43,750 trips. Can you show me a record where this many trips occurred? The same thing happened with the Holocaust in Germany during World War II. Six million people were supposedly killed, but there are not that many names referenced who died totaling six million. In fact, the official story has reduced the number to under one million. The Stuart synopsis lists these native tribes as originally black. The Washita of Louisiana, the Yamasee of the Southeast, the Iroquois, the Cherokee Indians, the Blackfoot Indians, the Pequot and Mohegans of Connecticut, the Black Californians, where Cal in California literally means black after the name of the great Mama Kali or Queen Khalifa, the Olmecs of Mexico, and the Darianite of Panama. The American Negro, Indian, Black Moor, or Mongolian Tartarian is the oldest man on Earth. In fact, the oldest chromosome on Earth was found in a man from South Carolina and is unrelated to African lineages. If all this alternative history is hard to grasp, it's important to note that quite possibly the most amazing theory brought forth to humanity comes from top Russian scholar Anatoly Fomenko. Fomenko is a full member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the International Higher Education Academy of Sciences, and Russian Academy of Technological Sciences as well as a doctor of physics and mathematics, and a professor and the head of the Differential Geometry and Applications Department of the Faculty of Mathematics and Mechanics at Moscow State University. 
His most controversial theory is that he believes all of recorded history has occurred since 800 AD, with the vast majority happening since 1000 AD. He presented his observations in a seven-volume book titled History, Fiction, or Science, where he proves that the world history has been widely falsified to suit the interest of a number of different conspirators, including the Vatican, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Russian House of Romanov, all working to obscure the true history of the world centered around a global empire called the Russian Horde. The same horde that destroyed Tartaria, according to Fomenko, may very well be responsible for erasing history and creating its very own version of it. Anatoly Fomenko has this remarkable theory that history has shifted and when it does, it duplicates with different names and locals, but essentially, the exact same story can be decoded and identified with its medieval origin. What's intriguing is these shifts aren't random. There's a Greco-Biblical shift of 1800 years, there's a Christian-Roman shift of about a thousand years, and there's a 333-year shift and also a 100-year shift that when applied correctly relate directly back to historical dates preceding the first records of history found anywhere beginning in 1200 AD. Here is a brief summary of the beginning of Fomenko's new chronology. In volumes 1, 2, and 3 of History, Fiction, or Science, Anatoly Fomenko and his colleagues assert the following, that different accounts of the same historical events are often assigned different dates and locations by historians and translators, creating multiple phantom copies of these events. These phantom copies are often misdated by centuries or even millennia and end up incorporated into conventional chronology. That the chronology was largely manufactured by Joseph Justice Scaliger in Opus Novum de Emendation Temporum, 1583, and Thesaurum Temporum, 1606, and represents a vast array of dates produced without any justification whatsoever, containing the repeating sequences of dates with shifts equal to multiples of the major Kabbalistic numbers 333 and 360. They assert that this chronology was completed by Jesuit Dionysius Tavius in De Doctrina Temporum in 1627 and 1632. They assert that archaeological dating, dendrochronological dating, paleographical dating, numismatic dating, and carbon dating, and other methods of dating of ancient sources and artifacts are erroneous, non-exact, or dependent on traditional chronology that their use in conjunction as confirming one another is a statistical fallacy. Probabilities can't be added. They assert also that there is not a single document in existence that can be reliably dated earlier than the 11th century. They assert that the histories of ancient Rome, Greece, and Egypt were crafted during the Renaissance by humanists and clergy, mostly on the basis of documents of their own making. They assert that the Old Testament is a rendition of events of the 14th to 16th century AD in Europe and Byzantium, containing prophecies about future events related in the New Testament, which is a rendition of events of 1153 to 1186 AD. They discover that the histories of religions runs as follows. The pre-Christian period, before the 11th century and Jesus Christ, the Bacchic Christianity, Jesus Christ Christianity, and its subsequent mutations into Orthodox Christianity, the Catholicism, and Islam. They assert that the most probable prototype of historical Jesus was Andronikos Komnenos, the Emperor of Byzantine, known for his failed reforms, his traits and deeds reflected in biographies of many real and imaginary persons. The historical Jesus is a composite figure and reflection of the Old Testament prophet Elisha, Pope Gregory VII, Saint Basil of Caesarea, and even Li Yuan Hao, also a reflection of Euclides, Bacchus, and Dionysius. Fomeco explains the seemingly vast differences in the biographies of these figures as resulting from difference in languages points of view and time frame of the authors of said accounts and biographies. 
He claims that the historical Jesus was born in Cape Filent, Crimea on December 25th, 1152 AD and was crucified on March 20th, 1185 AD on Joshua's Hill overlooking the Bosphorus. Anatoly Fomenko is not saying that Jesus didn't exist. He's simply stating that the timeline is inaccurate and there's a reason they created this timeline. Everything is to control you. Anatoly Fomenko's research has enlightened us to the fact of how much control was sought by erasing history, by confusing us of our past. If fake news today is created to control our minds, why wouldn't they create false history to do the same? Are you starting to see the possibility that we, as humanity, may have been drastically lied to? If this is true, what we've been taught has by design kept us in a box, close-minded to possibilities of what was and what could be. While most of our lives we've been referencing historical data as fact, we've been kept in the dark to limit our imagination, to halt the progress of further advancements for civilization. By lying and hiding truths, they gained a supreme ultimate control over our fate, over our mind. This may be the greatest psychological operation to have ever been amassed upon a public. Could all this imply as well what many theories have pointed to? That the Americas are the true old world? And that it is the true birthplace of civilization? Is it crazy to think America may very well be Atlantis and the origin of ancient Egyptian civilization? To New Year's, claim like this sounds outlandish. But let me ask you, why are FBI agents guarding a cave in the Grand Canyon? keeping hidden from public eyes temples and hieroglyphics we find only in ancient Egypt? Why are there more pyramids in the Americas than there are in Egypt? And why was the Smithsonian ordered by a Supreme Court ruling to admit that they were hiding the bones giants? If dendrochronology methods or dating the age of trees are misleading as stated by Fomenko, how would we prove that certain mountains aren't simply trunks of once cut down immensely gigantic trees. And lastly, why was the word dragon replaced by dinosaur, a word not in existence prior to mid-1800s? The Tartarian Empire may have just recently ended, but it strangely lives on in the world of cinematic fantasy. Like most government cover-ups, they fictionalize the truth by making it Hollywood. Think Game of Thrones. So if unintended disclosures occur, people will brush it off as Hollywood fantasy and choose to not believe it. In our next film, we'll explore the depths of proof that have illuminated millions in understanding that our world was once inhabited by mythical creatures, giants, incredible healing and energy technologies, and enlightened beings that lived under a simple rule that what you take from nature, you give back more. Stay tuned for our next film, The Tartarian Empire, Remnant Power.